Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another episode of Sultans and Sneakers. I'm your host, as always, Mahin the Podcaster. And on today's show, I am honored to have Sheikh Saleh Basir with me. Uh, Sheikh Saleh, thanks for uh, making some time today. Thank you for having me. Very yeah. It's been a long time. You know, I've been wanting to have you on for some time. Uh, you know, you're not a Chicago. You're here for some studies and whatnot. So I was like, I kept blowing it off because I figured I'd have you here for a little bit. And then um, it seems like your time here is going to be coming short fairly soon. So I was really going to regret not getting you in at some point. But thanks for um, thanks for coming on. Um, I want to start the show off really by commenting on your drip uh, because people who have listened to your content uh, or your interviews in the past have known that you have studied uh, in the Darul Ulum Azadville in South Africa, right? And you tell a story, I think, where it's like an all-white dress code, right? And I think you were talking about like how it was cold one time and you had like to wear some great sweatpants and then... Uh, the, one of the Molana subs like kind of chastised you for it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, you know, so first of all, super honored to have this opportunity, uh, okay. you know, and the, the conversations that you're having are very important. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, uh, I so I grew up in a household with three older sisters, um, you know, uh, in, in the Bay Area. And there there was a focus on sort of the Heather Bobby fashion style that, in fact, I would say my, my grandmother had sort of... Um, raised my mother in and then and then after my mom had raised us in so sort of that creativity um uh that south asian muslims have in sort of fashion i mean you can sort of think about in in like in our weddings Mm -hmm. um if you take any sort of muslim culture's wedding and you compare it to the desi muslim wedding it's a very sort of different experience there's a lot more colors there's a lot more sort of function and form right. and, and all of the interlace that also bleeds into our everyday lives. Mm-hmm. So yeah, when I was in Madrasa, it was, I remember it was very tough the first month um, to just shift to um, white shawar kameez only. I remember they said they, there had to be a slit of, what is it, six, seven inches of your kurta. Right. Otherwise it would be problematic. Like so, on the side, do you mean? Yeah, on the side. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so no thobes. Um, and, uh, and it, I mean, it's only challenging in the beginning, yeah. but, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously after you graduate, there's no real right. sort of mandate to, to stick with that. Although some people do. And I mean, obviously when you read the Sunnah and you read the Hadith of the Holy right. Prophet, especially in the, the chapter of, uh, of, of clothing in Mishkat al right. Musabih, you do see a diversity of clothes that the Holy Prophet alayhi salatu wore and, and stuff. And, and, uh, one of the, one of the wisdoms we can say in that is that people are, are attracted to different things, as the great Arab poet once said. You know, when mm-hmm. that uh, there are many different madhabs uh, for the things that people love. Right. Right. So yeah. I've heard also the white is a you know the analogy is is that like if you look at a pure heart. Yeah. Right. And then <clears throat> if a pure heart is stained with a sin, that person with a pure heart is usually able to like. And when you wear white, any kind of like stain will be highlighted right away. Whereas sure. like darker colors, you can get away. And so. Cause, and when you're wearing white, like people, that's why sometimes people don't want to wear white shoes or white shirts because of like you, you're gonna get it dirty and yeah. you get some pain. Um, but I've heard that like when you have it, therefore you're cognizant of that. And you want to get rid of it, and yeah. that same analogy works for your for the for the purification of the heart. Absolutely no, and like there there are definitely arguments for all colors, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, there's there's no doubt that white is also emphasized in the right. sunnah mm-hmm. um, as are other colors. Right. You know, we know for example that the Prophet did wear black. Right. We know that that uh, that he did wear red on yeah. on one occasion, or he allowed a Sahabi to wear to wear red on another occasion, and uh, you know, and I think that. Uh, we are obviously all products of our society. Sure. We're also products of our sort of ancestral right. sort of proclivities too. And I think that all sort of bears on how we approach our own dress. And again, um, fiqhan and hadithan and Quran, and I mean, there are definitely guidelines, right? right? Like there, uh, uh, one gender should not be imitating another gender, right. uh, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, right. I mean, these are, these are sort of some preliminary stuff that at least I, I live by, I try to live by. No, but for you, because I, I actually can't recall a time when you weren't wearing black. <laughs> so is black just is just easy is it like is it from a functionality point of view because it's just simple and easy yeah so i i would say first of all um imam muhammad the student of imam abu hanifa yeah, anhu, right. did encourage uh scholars to wear black okay. actually actually encouraged qadis okay and i'm not i'm not a qadi uh in the abbasid empire to wear black right right so uh there is that and i would say i just uh Perhaps it's influenced from my own siblings and right. have always sort of uh, moved towards that color. I mean, also, uh, uh, 
And this is a separate sort of Ottoman Mughal sartorial point, but I, we right. can address that later. Yeah. yeah. So um, now a lot of people go to South Africa to study um, from the United States, yeah. um, from especially from particularly from a South Asian background. But why South Africa versus like the Arab lands for you? Yeah, so uh, the year was 2009, 2010. Mm-hmm. I had completed my hiv back in 2005. You're right. Uh, no ulama in my family, vertically, horizontally. Sure. Uh, maybe just my brother also was a hafiz, and I think one other cousin amongst like hundreds of cousins that I have in America. So uh, I think that, uh, so I'm the youngest of five. Yeah. And uh, I, I think pretty much all my siblings were pre med, three, three were at Berkeley. And I think I sort of, uh, so, so I'm sort of explaining why I even did Alam course in the first place. But I think that, you know, at, at some point I was like, I, I kind of want to do this. And in my area, all we really had were Deobandi the Ulama mm-hmm. and Sheikh Hamzi Yusuf. Right. And uh, because I grew up more in a sort of Tablighi, uh, Deobandi background, uh, we really didn't have access or that much communication with Sheikh Hamzi Yusuf. So even though we did have people who did go to uh, Mauritania mm-hmm. and uh, even North Africa, uh, that that sort of Islamic experience was not shared with us or, or maybe just my... You know, my, my my family chose to sort of be around other South Asians. They opened these. And I was doing Arabic with uh, Mawana Tamim Ahmadi in sure. the Bay Area. And uh, basically within six, seven months, and me and two, three other students realized that uh, if we really want, you know, um, the full Alam course experience, we're probably going to have to travel just because of logistics and the, the nature some of these ad, ad hoc madaris are. Mm-hmm. And uh, because many, many of the scholars who are sort of also English-speaking born in America who had just come back Mm. from their cities that all come from South Africa, Mm -hmm. specifically Azadville. So uh, they knew the place, they knew the madrasa, uh, and they they were encouraging us to go to South Africa over the Arab world or India or Pakistan. They said, you know, definitely, yeah. yeah, They said definitely don't don't even go to India or Pakistan. You know, South Africa has that good balance of like, you know, fifth generation South Asians who are English-speaking, plus they have, you know, been able to preserve their ilm of uh of post mughal south asia pretty phenomenally so really okay yeah. so yeah because because if i if, if i if i'm thinking about trying to put myself in your shoes i'm, a, I'm like a you know deal bundy inclined kid 17 years old i'm thinking like you first of all, as a lay person you would think well why don't you just go to the source like go to darul Ulum deal yeah yeah or like yeah, yeah. The, or you go to nadua or the sure. matters in fact but, but is that because of cultural issues yeah yeah and i think i think perhaps a huge issue and we'll get into this later is that uh so my family does not speak urdu my family oh, okay. just speaks English. No kidding. Although we're an Urdu heritage family, our family only speaks Urdu. So, so my mom my mom speaks English and Spanish, even though she is Desi, because she was raised here. Okay. So yeah, so so Urdu was not a family it was not a language in our household. And uh, so that did factor into my decision. Now obviously now looking back it, it shouldn't have really mattered. Mm. But uh, so for me it's like I'm trying to study Islam, I'm trying to study Arabic, Quran, the, you know, Hadith, right, Tafsir, right. etc., Fiqh. And I, uh, I I, was like, you know, Urdu should not be factored into my considerations while studying Islam. And that will be a problem if I go to India or Pakistan. At least I, I had assumed, sort of. Right. Uh, and which is why South Africa was also appealing, because obviously uh, the majority of teachers and students would have been also native English speakers. Sure. What about places like England or places, I don't know, some places in Toronto or Buffalo or New York? Yeah, yeah. And I think that also the the sort of question lingering in our minds was that if we want to if we want to travel and study, we want to do something as as authentic, as sort of long-standing, as established as possible, right. without sort of being overwhelmed with Urdu. And I think that was the that was the sort of calculus that me and some of the, my other peers were making at the time. Okay. Yeah. Now you've mentioned in South Africa that the curriculum is second to none, but I don't know if you get a chance to flesh that out. Yeah. Like, can you explain that a little bit and why why you think the curriculum is so good? Yeah, so yeah, obviously when I say second to none, I mean that in a sort of hyperbolic sense, but yeah. I do I do believe that it was an exceptional, exceptional curriculum. Sure. <coughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, f- so first of all, it's just the emphasis on Arabic. Okay. And again, I, I, you know, I'm saying this as a, as a graduate, as someone who's spent, you know, four to five years there and then come back here and have in- interact with the graduates from Pakistan, from India, from the Arab world, mm. you know, from, from, from America, from Canada. And uh, I, I, do, I do feel like the way that the mother's curriculum was structured, um, the way that the teachers and the classes were sort of struct- uh, 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 set up, 
it, it was really set up for, for someone to succeed in all spheres of Islamic knowledge. I, and I say all, I mean the main ones, i.e. Arabic, fiqh, uh, tafsir, hadith, usul al-fiqh, uh, you know. And uh, I think that, that that basis was super, super beneficial because I saw, I saw some people my own age who, uh, and I'm sure a lot of people, you know, a lot of other Muslims who grew up in the same time that I did, saw a lot of Muslims, they would spend seven, eight, nine years studying this institution, that institution, they would come back and, you know, it would be very disappointing to see where they were at, whereas, you know, uh, you know, at least I can say for me and, you know, some other peers in Azadville, within a year or two, I mean, our, you know, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our, our Arabic was was uh, at, a, at, a, at a, you know, I would say at, at an advanced level where we could read the Qur'an, you know, read tafsir books without i'rab, without harakat, you know, within a year, year and a half. And I thought that was something that I didn't really see in other madaras. And perhaps it is possible, obviously, I haven't done an isti'ab or right. entire survey of every single madrasa, but from what, I mean, I have seen graduates okay. from, from, from madrasas who cannot read Arabic properly. And I'm not, there's not just one or two, but a lot, right. you know, or, or kids who, uh, or st graduates who, who will not open a book outside of the curriculum or open an Arabic Arabic book outside of the genre mm -hmm. of the curriculum that that, that that they were exposed to in Madrasa. So um, I would say Azadbul set me up extremely well to read Arabic books across all genres. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously the article on Taha Abdul Rahman, Taha sure. Rahman is a modern Arab author, right? right. He is someone who uh, uses modern Arabic, you know, uh, coinages and stuff like that. But also he's very creative with his Arabic, um, and he sort of forces the reader to employ all of all all of the Arabic sort of available to him in our Torah or in our civilization. And I think right. the only reason why I can approach his works right. is, is because of the sort of South African Arabic instruction. Yeah. Okay, cool. I, I was going to say, um, but you also, had, but then you were there, what, was it five or six years? Yeah. So I had done my first year yeah. uh, with with basically Mona Tamim. Okay. And uh, yeah, and then second to sixth year in, in, in Azadville. But, you know, well, you were there for a lengthy amount of time, but you but you talked about the challenges of like the cultural difference. You're going you're going for the Bay Area, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, and um, what keeps you going early on? Because I had imagined that like okay, maybe in the beginning there's like I imagine it's some kind of like boot camp in a way. Yeah, because you you don't you don't have like you're probably not you don't get to watch TV or movies or anything like that. You don't even have a cell phone, right? So like when you first like when you first get there, is it like this like Obviously, it's not, I don't want to say culture shock, but like almost like you feel like imprisoned in a way that and, and, and you have to like probably get past a certain point where you, then you're like, okay, I'm good. Yeah. You, is, is that an experience that's typical of a student of knowledge that does that kind of thing? Yeah. So let me walk you through at least some of what I was experiencing. Also, I've never really said this publicly, sure. but I guess bismillah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, no, I mean, definitely, you know, as a kid, you know, coming from the Silicon Valley, yeah. to, you know, uh, both of my parents are engineers. Right. Uh, you know, everyone in my family is basically between, you know, between either a physician or an engineer. Nobody has pursued this before. So it's not like I'm being forced into this. It's not like anybody's even encouraged. In fact, I would say most of my family is just discouraging me to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, some like really hurtful comments was, were said to me by like various family members before I went to South Africa to study. Right. Uh, but yeah, no, it is shocking, right? So that, you know, you can only wear a white thopi, you can only wear white shavar kameez, no phone, no cell phone, classes six days a week. Uh, but I think for me, you know, uh, obviously the, there's no shower, so it's just, it's like bucket showers. Oh, okay. Right. And, and then sometimes the hot water runs out. Right. So you don't even have hot, so it's not only is it a bucket shower, it's, it's cold water. Right. right. And every day, uh, and I can say this at least for myself, it's like, I'm, I'm choosing to be there. Right. Right. It's like, I'm choosing to put myself through all of this. Right. Whereas, you know, any day I wanted, I could have just called my dad. Mm and flew back home and started college and, you know, did do pre-med like, like three of my other siblings, you know? Right. So uh, I think, I think that was a lot harder, right? It wasn't that like, oh, you, you know. You knew you had, you knew you had an escape hatch. Yeah, that exactly. Call on that, 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 that hovered in my mind every single day or any, anytime anything went wrong, that was always in the back of my mind because I, I knew that if I left or I dropped out, I would in fact be encouraged you know, and I would sort of be celebrated in the act, you know, right? by, wow. by, by okay. my own family. So, uh, and, and not to say that they were not supportive. And yeah. Definitely, like, within the first couple of months, I would say a lot of my family had sort of come on board uh, just because this was so foreign to them, right? Because a lot of Muslims, 
Uh, they don't know the difference between a Hafiz, an Alam, a Mufti, a Maulana, right. a right. Sheikh, a Qadi. This is all sort of blurred to them, and that's also our fault for not teaching them. But I remember uh, my cousin, my own first cousin, uh, when I was traveling to South Africa. Right. Uh, uh, she was like, wait, why are, why are you going to become a Maulana? You're already a Hafiz. Because in her mind, it was right, like all the, the same, same right? right? Maulana, Hafiz, Imam, these are all sort of used as the, there's no sort of like real appreciation for higher Islamic learning. Right. And uh, so, yeah, no, it was it was challenging. But I think for me, um, within, within by, by the first month and a half, so term started in September, this is back in 2010, uh, by like mid October, late November, I was I was already sort of integrated, right? And the uh, the preliminary challenges were were uh, were pretty much removed. And uh, man, I was honestly I was having the time of my life studying. Yeah. I really enjoyed Arabic grammar. I really enjoyed our tafsir class. Oh my god, uh, we called it Quran Tarjuma, but it was like translation plus a little bit of tafsir. And yeah, I don't know. I was sort of the the amount again the amount of knowledge that. Azadul was was sort of handing to us on a day to day was fin it was you know otherworldly. So you all, you almost felt like it wasn't like so I'm I have a mechanical engineering degree, yeah. right? When you're studying like the intro engineering class like statics and dynamics, yeah. you, it's a bunch of formulas. You don't know what the application is, yeah, and it becomes very dry. Oh, and I also like people. You probably have encountered people probably ask you a lot about like Arabic. How do you they want to study Arabic? And most people. Or take a class or two, and then they just like yeah, it just, it's just so dry. So, it, was there an application? Pro was there? Did you feel like you were applying the knowledge right away, or did it like like w what was it about it that made it like so? I guess a rich experience for you. Yeah. So uh, obviously, we'll, we'll probably talk about this later, but uh, um, I I only had exposure to two languages before Arabic. I used Spanish. I took I went to sort of Spanish elementary school, and then I and then I took Japanese in high school. So I only had exposure to two languages prior to that. Mm -hmm. And then, so when I was sort of being exposed to Arabic, uh, I think it was uh, for me. And like, there's there are definitely many many formulae. I mean, yeah. obviously, various regions have 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 their own pedagogies for for teaching Arabic. But I think for me, it was like the exposure, the immersion, and the hawk's eye view of Arabic grammar. So obviously, sadf, which is etymology or conjugation, and nahu, which is grammar, uh, and uh, and. Learning the laws, I think, uh, you know, can be obviously very formulaic, very abstract. But what I was very, very blessed and very fortunate to have was that there was a teacher in Azadville, um, and uh, he was he had just been sort of recruited as a teacher. But was it before Fajr or after Fajr? Uh, we would take a book with no arab, mm -hmm. so none of the diacritical marks, right. and he would just tell me to read, mm -hmm. right? So and this is so literally throwing me into the ocean because even if you're in a class and a teacher asks you to read, you're not going to be asked to read every single day. Right. So you're not, you're not going to be asked to apply all you know the the hundreds of sarf and nahu rules every single you know every single day. If you know, in fact, it'll be you know maybe once a month or once every two or three weeks. But here I'm doing it every single day. And it's just, and it's also one on one. Yeah. Right. So we would do it. We would sit in that li in the in the library, and he would uh, uh, he would just tell me to read, and he would, he would ask me to explain every single grammatical and etymological and linguistic and semantic detail of of every single word mm -hmm. and the larger paragraph and the larger sentence and the larger page, and we did that I think for like six seven months. And I remember feeling super uncomfortable because it's like, you're, that, that's where, because just to read one sentence of Arabic, you have to know the entire, you have to know the entire sort of manual of Arabic grammar back to, you know, right. back to finish. So, sure. uh, so you're really forced to deal with that concretely. And uh, I would say that was probably the biggest helping factor because once you have Arabic, and I always tell this to kids who, who are starting off studying or in the midst of studying is that if you have Arabic, everything else opens up, you know, and, uh, you know, and there's a very deep wisdom on the Ottoman and the Mughal education system, as well as the uh, the the Seljuk and the Aqayonlu educational systems, and you know that has obviously sort of been ferried over into the modern traditional mother system, and it's very beneficial if you know how to sort of practice on it. Yeah. How many hours are you sleeping a night during your madrasa studies? Yeah. So I would, I'm someone who needs my sleep, so I would I would I would make sure that I have at least five to six hours of sleep a day. Okay. Yeah. Because like. You talk about because you always hear about like Isha. I don't know. How the, I don't know how the, the uh, timings work in South Africa. So yeah, yeah, different, yeah. right? But you're probably not sleeping before you. You gotta pray, pray, pray Isha in the like the Musalla or the yeah. Masjid there. Yeah, yeah, right? exactly, exactly. As an obligate, you know, and then 
you can probably crash right after. Yeah. Uh, but then you're up probably before Fudger. Yeah, 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 exactly. So it's so. like, depend- and then, but do they allow time for like Kailulas and things like they that? They do, they do. They do have, they, our breaks are basically from after Fudger to class time, right. which can, varying on the season, can be one to two hours. Yeah. And then Kailula. Yeah. And then after Asr to Maghrib, which also varies. So obviously in the summer, it's like an mm. hour and a half. In the winter, it's like, 45 minutes gotcha gotcha so yeah so now after south africa did you go right into colombia then yeah so basically after madrasa um because i had graduated high school which which i think that you know if if more madrasa graduates at least have a high school degree then they have a lot more options when they come back because i've seen madrasa graduates who maybe want to pursue some other form of learning yeah but they're handcuffed by the fact that they're like wait but like i have to get a ged or or oh, because they're yeah. they're going when they're like 14 or 15 yeah yeah i mean a lot of i'd say the 90 95 percent of american kids in azadville didn't have a high school diploma no kidding maybe even more oh, but really? yeah okay so uh yeah i mean they would they would start because they would start hibs at 10 11 and right. then after hibs they would go straight into alum course Oh, okay, and yeah. then they would go back. So, so you had you did you so you were applying to universities and back in, back home, like yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and then uh, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, I I sort of had like a good story. Um, I was able to sort of study for the SAT, you know, as a, oh. as a, a little bit older, and and I mean, obviously, look, look, my uh, you probably have better study habits by then. Too. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that that was really. I mean, I had I had a teacher in Azad, Mufti Masood, Atallahu Amrahu wa Madallahu Fiyudahu. I mean, incredible, one of the most brilliant people, one of the most loving and most brilliant people. He was probably the one of the greatest usulis alive, legal yeah. theorists of Islam alive right now. Um, and I got and I'll, I'll try to speak more about him later. But uh, really, all of my study habits. Any any uh, any fawaid that I was able to gain from mm-hmm. Azadville and Madrasa was really was really through his guidance, and uh, you know you when you when you read Mulana Rumi about Shams at the Brez, uh, and I'm not to say that I was his murid or anything, right. but and I don't I don't even think it was anything near what Mulana Rumi shared with Hazrat Shams at the Brez, but uh, I mean you you really see how much just one teacher can right. shift because I saw other Americans who were with me right. and who maybe like didn't have a, such a close relationship with like a senior teacher and you know and like you you see the differences this reminds me uh, you know our we have a mutual friend Sidi Umar Hasib right yeah yeah he talks yeah. about like say the uh, say Ayashi in um uh, in, in Fez who's mm. like 120 years old who, oh, like, subhanallah. I don't yeah. know if you know I don't know if he showed you a story where he basically be, he basically took him into his own house and he mm. lived with them and he made sure he was um, he kind of was a Murabi figure, yeah. And he made sure he wasn't hanging out with the other Karawitan students and like you know wasting time and all that yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he and he told me now that's probably what got him through, and probably those and you build those habits because a lot of us don't have that kind of like mentor. It's like a mentorship yeah. program in, in in a way that I think that is lacking today. Um, that in the traditional sense we would have because you know even every field, sure, apprentice. Uh, program, you know, then yeah. that no longer, no longer exists, and and, and, and you know we're, we're feeling the pain now. I exactly, think. exactly, and I think um, in sort of secular modernity, yes. right? And you talk about guilds and apprentices, uh, you know, your master. When I say master, I mean like your teacher. So let's let's say your blacksmith master, right? right. Like you're sort of carving steel to make swords. I mean, that person was was professionally and emotionally invested, right? But mm-hmm. but in today's world, let's, let's say if you have an advisor, an academic advisor, right. there has to be some dis like like there's a lot more distance. Obviously, some distance always needs to be maintained, right? But in today's world, there's a lot more distance. Mm-hmm. Whereas I feel like in the pre-modern Muslim model, right, um, they're emotionally invested in you, and that's that's not a bad thing. And like I don't think we should see it as a bad thing. Uh, because if you if you're academically invested in someone, you should definitely be emotionally, and of course. You know, syllogistically, you should most absolutely be spiritually invested in that person. And I found that with Mufti Masood, I mean, um, you know, I, I felt so much love for him. And, and although, I mean, he was very busy. I mean, I mean, he was the Na'ib Mufti or the sort of uh, uh, the the vice Mufti, you could say. Sure. So we had, we had the senior Mufti and then we had, he, he was the vice Mufti. So we had to take care of IFSA students. He was teaching advanced Hanafi law. He's also t- teaching Shafi'i law. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he was making time for a 16-year-old kid from California, mm-hmm. you know, uh, almost every single day for right. like half an hour to an hour right. was something that like still moves me a lot. And you know, I was uh, when I was in Uzbekistan, and I went to the grave of uh, of uh, Sahib al Hidayah Burhanuddin Malakani, one of the most you know signature sort of texts of the Madrasa curriculum. Mm-hmm. I like I just I just I made dua for Mufti Masood, you know, because mm-hmm. it was uh, he uh, he was someone that uh, there is no you know I, you know I would not be a Mufti today. I would not be I would not be someone who perhaps even does 
the, the things that I do today, I would not probably have studied any of the stuff that I have studied without just one person's mentorship and guidance and right. literally his, just his, 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 his affection mm -hmm. for, I mean, he's a South African Maimon Mufti. Right. You know, what, what, what investment should he have in, you know, a Heather Badi Muslim from California for sure. who's 16 years old. Yeah. Wait, so you graduated high school when you're like 15 or 16? 16. Yeah. I was 16. 16 yeah, yeah. And then, so you start Columbia, what, like you're at 21, 22? I was 20, 20, 22. Yeah. 21, okay. 22. Yeah. So how was that? You're, so the other freshmen are like 18. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was sort of, uh, it was sort of interesting. Uh, so, so I was a transfer and, uh, there, there were also, uh, not a lot, but there were also some people, like let's say some uh, some people who, who go to the army, so they're veterans, okay. or so like there are some of that, but obviously like I'm not spending too much time with them. Yeah. Um, but just because I was two or only like two or three years older, it wasn't it wasn't that insane. But although even in that age, yeah. two or three years can be a lot, right? From right. Like being like a freshman right. to to a junior or a senior. Right. Uh, but uh, but also like obviously like there's graduate students and stuff. But definitely the first year when I'm sort of making that transition. Uh, from uh, you know, from from mothers to college, uh, uh, was was definitely challenging finding my place because obviously you're coming, you're also coming in as a transfer, so you don't have that sort of entering freshman class that you might have because been a beneficiary. You mean some of your courses work at Darul Ulum Azad? No, 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 no. I transferred. Uh, I transferred from a local college in the Bay Area. From where? From a local college in the oh, Bay Area. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You, so you, so you would. So you went South Africa back to the Bay? Yeah, back to the Bay, and then after a year, I transferred to, uh, to okay. yeah, to, okay. to Colombia. Yeah. Now, w w when did your Mughal history or the the I guess the interest in the Mughal start? Yeah. Um, oh man, so we're do we're doing the 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 whole life and survey, huh? Well, well, so, I, well, yeah. well I think that's where people, because I'll, I'll be honest with you, right? I, we've talked about it before. In two thousand and eight, I'm Bangladeshi, yeah. right? And um, when I first came across you, it was on Clubhouse. <laughs> oh, interesting. You, yeah, yeah. You so, were these clubhouse rooms, you right? Mean to th to, you mean 2021? Yeah, but I, I, I correct, right? Around the, yeah, 20, 2021. During the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. but I, yeah, during the pandemic, right? I hear you talking about the Mughals and this history and stuff, and I'm like, well, and it. I remembered in 08, I go to Bangladesh because I grew up here in America. I was two years old when I left. I went back when I was 16 for the first time. Um, and our impression is South Asian Muslims in America, I think we just think our people are super backwards. Mm. I think that's the idea, right? Um, I was no different. Um, you go there and everything's like, you know, if you just, you, oh, you got to bribe people and this and that. And then I go in 08 and then um, I'm with, it was my, it was my favorite, I was, to this day, probably my favorite Bangladesh trip ever. Oh, no way. 2015? 2008. 2008. 2008, okay. I go, right? Yeah. I'm not married yet. Um, my dad actually helped me. So I, um, the story of this trip was, Cyclone Sitter had hit Bangladesh. It was, mm. a, it was a big, uh, you know, yeah, every, yeah, yeah. every like decade or so, there's like this, you know, they always get flooding and stuff, but there's like every decade or 15, 20 years, there's like a big one, right? Mm. So that was a big one. And at the time, we had a caretaker government, like the two, Sheikh Hasina and Begum Khalida Zia. They were like normally two ladies that are always jockeying for power there for the last 30 years. Uh, they actually both were like under house arrest. Uh, I think the, the military had taken over and there was like a caretaking government, right? And so... And but with the cyclone, my dad had raised all these funds, and he asked me to take it over there and present it to the to the, actually the the guy who was running the government. Yeah, more yeah, or less. yeah. So he had this thing. I got to go to what essentially the the prime minister's office um, at the time. Um, but then, um, but I had all this downtime. I had no, my mom wasn't with me, and you know, if you ever go to like people who are Bengal, I don't know if it's for India or Pakistanis, but like your family members sometimes don't let you go anywhere because you're mm. oh you're gonna get you're gonna get um, abducted. And ransomed off or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like my mom, my mom wasn't with me, and my cousin at the time, doing six months older than me, basically had was between like, you know, he had all a free, he had a lot of free time, so he took me everywhere, and so he took me to like the Lalbagh fort. Oh wow! Uh, which I show you pictures of, and I got a chance to go again. Say, this past. say, say, say the name again. The Lalbagh fort. Lalbagh. So it's like the Red Garden. Yeah, Lalbagh yeah. fort. So. I didn't know what it was. Oh, this also, is also all. If you notice, most Muslim forts. Yeah. So in Spain, it's yeah. Al Hamra, okay. which is the red fort. Oh, okay. And then Lahore, it's Lahore and Delhi, it's Al Qila, which is a red fort. And I then, gotcha. And then Bengal is obviously so right. It's red, yeah. So, so, so I, so I see, I see this. I, I, he takes me there. It's like this, like it's like this old palace. I guess the governor, the the, the Mughal governor of that district used to reside there. Mm, yeah. Um, and so there's like there's a, there's a palace, there's a masjid, the, Allah, the, yeah. there's um. You know, gardens everywhere. They have like irrigate. They have like irrigation uh, sewage systems that are like from the 1600s. Um, they even sh sh talk about like how they used to like even if there were traders, there were tunnels that would go to like India, 
or there's also tunnels that like they would gas like traders <laughs> like you know they would put the traders in and, and, and like infuse it with like poisonous gas and stuff so i had no idea what it was i was like this is interesting yeah right i post some pictures and then one of my friends is like man bengal used to have so much wealth dude. Yeah, yeah yeah and i was like really and it kind of it's a passing thought and then after meeting you and hearing your stuff and i went so when i went back this time i was like i'm trying to look at like my bengali heritage through that lens of like this 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 because uh, you talk about you specifically mentioned Dhaka that's where I'm that's where I was born right Jahangir and I got, you yeah. know what I'm saying as like yeah. one of the main cities of the Mughal Empire right so so I think that's the appeal I think um, I still don't now granted I'm I'm be honest it's not like oh I'm now obsessed with the Mughals but like I have an appreciation for you should it. be the, no you know I'm kidding yeah, you know yeah. but but I, I want to yeah, know yeah, how yeah. you how you became that way because in California I, I I'd assume it's the same thing you're probably like yeah I. Especially when you're talking about, like, your family didn't even, you didn't even speak Urdu in the household, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. No, for sure. I mean, um, perhaps because I'm I'm third generation Muslim yeah. in America. Yeah. My grandparents came in the 60s. Okay. So perhaps I have more distance. Yeah. For, so um, I'm willing to, to, to maybe have more generosity with our tradition and our past historically and right. literarily. Yeah. So uh, I, um, and obviously, you know, coming, spending, t- you know, spending including Hibs and Alam course, it's been, what, 12, 13 years in various Madadis. Right, right. So, and w- which is a South Asian tradition. So, like, you sure. can sort of see it. Right. But, but in Mother's, uh, and definitely not in Mother's, uh, is there this sort of macro lens of, like, how, how is Islam traveling? Where is Islam going? What is Islam doing to places like Central Asia, mm. Eastern Europe, North yeah. Africa, West Africa, East Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia? None of that is, I, I don't believe that any Mother's really teaches that in the world, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, so, I think that... Having studied so many texts intellectually, um, I was I was maybe aching for something to to string it all together historically. Mm-hmm. So I was an undergrad. Um, I loved fiqh and madrasa. I loved both fiqh and usul al-fiqh, uh, mirath, and, and and so forth. And uh, I was like, I think I probably want to do law, you know. And uh, so I was political science mm-hmm. uh, because that's what everybody just seems to do. And right. again, remember, everybody in my family has either, um, even though um, you know. Everybody has gone to college and uh, has a professional degree, yeah, yeah. medicine or engineering. Right, basically medicine, engineering. Some some have become lawyers, but even if they had become lawyers, they probably studied political science too. Right, right. So it's like even if there's like more diversity in my family, mm. um, that diversity is like very very limited. So right. there's not even a horizon. It's like yeah, like when you open like your booklet and you see like 35 majors of like art history, architecture, comparative literature, musicology, ethnography, sociology. Right. You know, you see all these majors and you're like, I don't even I don't even know what this means. You know, you see, you know, you see bio, you see chem, you see physics, you see political science, and uh, and then if you really want a high GPA, you do Middle Eastern studies, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, you know, so like these are sort of the uh, the the way that I think that most Muslims approach like their majors, um, but I think that the the nature of Colombia, where you had a lot of um, a lot of people, but especially some Muslims who might have came from backgrounds where both of their parents were already physicians. So when they came to college, they were studying other things. Okay. So we actually had a pretty good community of people, of both Desis, Arabs, um, and other Muslims who were studying like a wide variety of things. And I remember, uh, uh, I just remember meeting this one, one Egyptian, uh, and I think perhaps the most brilliant person I've ever met in my life. Uh, she was... She was uh, she was two years ahead of me, but a year younger than me, just okay. because of the age thing. Right. Um, yeah, super super brilliant. She was a history major. Okay. And I remember the first time I met her, she was like, "Oh yeah, like I'm studying history," and I was like, "History," yeah. and I was like, "Why would this like 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 why would you?" I was like, "Dude, you had this amazing opportunity to study at this you know private school. Like, why would you come here and study history? Like, you could." I want you to become like a lawyer, like a world famous physician or something, right? right? right. Like, why would you study history? Like, I remember, yeah. you know, and although, which is so wild because it's like, if you think about it on a, on a sort of broader, more meta level, Mother says, is, is, it's just, it's, it's basically the humanities. Yeah. It's just, it's language, right. it's logic, it's right. literature, it's law. Right. Right. It's, yeah. you, you, if you think about like the Oxford PPE, like politics, philosophy, economics, right. it's you literally, the, the, the Malanas, they just expanded it a thousand years. Imam Ghazali just ex- expanded it, you know? Right. Uh, so, uh, so even though like I've just been in the humanities, not realizing that I actually am a deep ashik of the humanities, right? Um, and I guess political science is, is technically humanities, although like there is a stats element to it now. Um, I and I was I was very like weirded out, but I remember um, 
I, you know, by, by virtue of uh, my father being in Tabligh, he would always narrate stories of Hayat al-Sahaba growing up. And he himself definitely had an interest in history. But again, like there aren't a lot of, ev especially when you and I were growing up. Yeah. I mean, other than like these very poorly published books from Pakistan and South Africa, there was no like sophisticated, you know, uh, presentation of our, of our past, right? It was right. very, very slipshod, very, very half-baked. Yeah. And uh, so this idea of even studying you know, history professionally or academically was not, even though, you know, people like uh, Imam Sakhawi and Ibn Hajar wrote Rasa'il Rasa or treatises on the importance of studying history, let alone all of the, you know, hundreds of historians in Mughal India. And uh, so I, uh, I, I took an Ottoman history class. And this Ottoman history class, I was taught with this professor, visiting professor from Boazji University. He's actually the leading Ottoman professor in the world. Yeah. Uh, he, he's also a double-time professor at College, uh, college de, de, de Peri. And uh, he... Uh, that was his name. What was his name again? Adham Eldam. Okay. Professor Adham Eldam. Phenomenal. Oh, my God. He would he would come into class. Yeah. You know, and obviously, I'm someone who has, you know, been in Madrasa. I've, I've seen, you know, so much of, of, the, of the brilliance of the Islamic tradition, but I've, I had never seen a class like this before. Did you like history as a kid growing Definitely, up? Definitely. But again, there's no there, there's no language for this, right? Like history, history is like a childhood's pastime. It's like it's a class you get an A in in fourth grade. It's social studies, you know? So it's like... Well, you know, I, I, I'll like... So I remember if I look at my childhood, right? Yeah. I was really passionate about history. Um, I actually... Um, like, I, I was the kid who memorized all the presidents. So when I was in yeah. first grade, Reagan was the president. So he was number oh, 40. Oh, wow. Yeah. So to this day, when you know when you memorize something when you're yeah, five or six... Yeah, it stays with you. Like, you know, I, if somebody if somebody spit off a number... And I could be like, okay, that was like Millard Fillmore. Oh, right. Wow. Or yeah, something yeah, like yeah. that, right? He's pretty, no, one, no one's heard. Some of these irrelevant he was president. president what, 1880s? Like Millard Fillmore, he was, he would have been like number 13, I think. What year, what year, do you remember what four years was that? So he was, Lincoln was 16. Okay. So 18, Lincoln was 1860, 1861 to 1865, right? Yeah. Um, so he would have been like 18, maybe 30s or 40s or something okay. around their okay. time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But like, I was like, these, you got, these, you know, these, pre these certain presidents. But I was really interested in that, and maybe because my proximity sure, to, sure. to like the world around me as a kid, as a six year old. Um, but I remember my cousin, who's older than me, he was like, "What do you want to study? When you, what do you want to study when you grow up?" I'm like, "Social studies or history." Like, yeah. There's no money in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, in fact, I had, I had, I had a similar conversation, but on the reverse. I remember when I was in seventh grade. Yeah. I just finished Hibs, and I was taking class at a local community college, Algebra One, I think. Yeah. And I asked a guy, I was like, "What are you studying?" He's like, "I'm studying history." I was like, "Why would you study that?" So I was like, on the on the reverse uh, side. Uh, but definitely, there was. I remember when I was in fourth grade. Obviously, we have to study like state history. Yeah. I loved California history. Mm. Um, you know, obviously not not excusing the the very uh, you know violent colonialism of, yeah. of, of California, but um, I remember. I mean, I you know did really well even and even in high school, right before I graduated and left to South Africa, um, I took AP World History. Right. I love that it was first period in the morning. Mm. I took the AP World exam. A, Mrs. Benton, I remember, yeah. and it was yeah. I mean, so we, so I feel, like I feel like when I look back on my life, it does make sense for right. me to end up where I am. Right. But if you told me when I was sixteen that this is what I I was going to do, I would probably laugh. You know. Mm. So his Ottoman history class is kind of the one that like sparks. Yeah, yeah. Sparks. And like I could sort of start seeing it because like at Columbia, obviously very humanity. We have something called the core, like required literature, required. I, I'm familiar with it. I applied to Columbia. I didn't get in. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know the core. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I heard of it. Yeah. So like Western, Chicago is something similar, right? Something similar. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's like what masterpieces of Western civilization, both in political thought and literature. Right. So like that is a form of history, right? right? It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a political history and it's, a, it's a literary history. So it was sort of being nourished. But again, it's obviously very European, very yeah. white. Um, I took this Ottoman history class, and luckily it was with, I would say, perhaps the leading Ottoman historian in the world, and he, he comes in and every day, so we'd meet on Wednesdays, 10.10 10 to 12.20, okay. from what I remember, yeah. 2015, 2016, and he would come into class, and he would just draw an, he would just draw, uh, an X and Y line on, yeah. the, on the board, right. and he would just write dates, right. and he would cover the whole century, so let's say... The 14th century, right, and he would cover major events, right, and of the whole hundred years. So, yeah. like, let's say if you take the 14th century, you can think about the conquest of Borsa, mm -hmm. you can think about the Timar system, you can think about uh, Timur Lung's invasion, um, Bayezid Yildirim's conquest in, ba in the Balkans, and so forth. And uh, he would just he would go over major political, economic, and social events. Right. And uh, and then he would talk about methodology by which to sort of study and understand this beyond Orientalist approaches to history and uh, sort of critically reading Ottoman chronicles. And obviously we're reading in, in, in translation. I don't know Turkish at the time. And I had never seen any class like this before in my life. Okay. And the sophistication by which sort of the holisticness of talking about a society and all of its dimensions 
po uh, political, historical, social, literary, artistic, poetic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, medical, so, uh, you know, punitive. It's literally anything you can think about he was discussing and he himself was a trained both social and economic historian of the Ottoman Empire. So he wrote a, a couple of books on like Ottoman maritime traffic and Ottoman mm -hmm. banks. Right. Uh, but uh, he, man, it was it was so, so awesome just to see him do that. And I think that as I as I saw him, right. you know, do that every class, I was like, right. the 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 joy of just seeing him do that, the joy of the readings that he would assign us. Right. And because he was, you know, had a hawk's eye view of the Ottoman field. Right. He was someone who uh, who could really, really offer us something to uh, to uh, you know engage the field by. Okay. And I think I think that's that's I didn't really shift. Yeah. Totally, but that was a singular moment by which I remember I was like, this is something that uh, I feel moved more than in any other than a al fiqh, al fiqh. I felt the same way in mother okay. uh -huh. said al sure. But this was the second time I, I had that same feeling. Yeah. In your Ottoman history class, did he ever talk about, was it any topic about like the intersection of the Ottomans and the Mughals that N triggered it? Or No, no, no. Although his, uh, no, I, I probably can't say this publicly, but uh, he, yeah. So, so don't uh, say publicly. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you. I'll tell you later. Tell no, 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 no. Oh, yeah. But I mean, like, so me and him, me and him would have conversations right, after. Right. So, uh, but I think uh, it was, uh, it was just an approach to the a world of Islam. Right. An approach to the world of post-classical Islam because yep. everyone's always talking about how Islam ended mm. during the sack of Baghdad. Right. Whereas I was like, you know, and because I had this training in traditional madrasa of like, yeah. I knew what fiqh looked like. Right. I knew, I knew what the ulama were studying. Mm -hmm. I knew, I knew what they were reading. I knew sort of common books that were sort of, sort of already in the air. Obviously I knew Arabic and, and, uh, you know, and, all the, and obviously, you know, being a hafid and being someone who had studied tafsir intimately, it was like, I could sort of see flickers of that in the civilization. Yeah you know, looking from an outsider, you know, uh, so many years after. So uh, it was just just to sort of be transported to those moments mm -hmm. uh, was, was something so elevating. Mm -hmm. And I feel like really deepened uh, my experience with the, with the tradition. Okay. So, uh, in, so in ways that the mother said did not. I got yeah. you. So I guess where did the, the Mughals then do come in for you? Then? Yeah. So I took the Ottoman history class. Right. And so now... I'm like, wow, this is, but, and also remember that, uh, I was, I was pre-law at that time and, 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 and to be a lawyer, the, the two major skills that you want is reading and writing. Yeah. Right. And what I, what I realized in that class was that more than my political science classes, I feel like I'm being trained better on how to, on how to read and how to read sources critically and historiographically and I'm being trained on how to write critically mm -hmm. and I'm being asked to write more actually. So that was, so I was sort of, that was already in my head and then I took a Mughal history class in the summer. Uh, it was a Mughal history intensive. So um, it's actually so wild how everything turns out. But um, I was, uh, um, I, uh, I was, tr studying for the LSAT because mm -hmm. I was going to apply, I'm gonna apply to law school in the fall. Right. And uh, I. Uh, so you're like a junior, like by yeah. Okay. I'm I'm a junior, and I'm I'm like, listen, uh, I need to study for the LSAT, but I see this class, and I'm like, man. It'd be like really awesome if like, yeah, you know, I go to law school, but at least I have an Ottoman class and I have a Mughal class under my belt. And I think that'd be like really awesome. And I have this, uh, I had this mentor in the Bay Area. He was a bro. He's also a lawyer, a uh, Punjabi Muslim guy. And uh, he, uh, he was like, I don't really think that you should take it just because like you want to focus on that. I was also interning uh, mm -hmm. at the same time. So uh, I was like, man, let me just, let me just show up the first day and like, let's see what happens. Right. Oh, so, you were interning at a law firm. Uh, no, no, I was not. I was actually in, interning for, uh, for, for, for a Congress. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, cool. yeah. Okay. D during that time. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Carolyn Maloney. Okay. Yeah. So if, if I remember correctly. And, uh, so I, uh, um, I, I show up to the first day of class mm -hmm. and he's just showing trailers for like various like video games, like age of civilizations, empire, total war, mm -hmm uh some other shows and stuff and he was like this is how people in the modern world conceive of empires and entertainment right and then it was and i was like why are we watching GameSpot reviews like in a Mughal history class right <laughs> and then uh and then after a little bit uh and then we move on to the first Mughal king either in that class or the next class and it was like three hours every single day and uh the way the way i enjoyed that class it definitely superseded the ottoman history class and uh, so, so we first started off with some literature on the first Mughal king who, you know, spent most of his life in what is present day Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and Afghanistan and his sort of conquest of India in the 16th century. And uh, I'll never forget it. I'll never forget this moment. It was in July, uh, actually not July, maybe mid-June um, in New York. So very muggy, 
sort of winter. I'm, I'm like two blocks away from Central Park, mm-hmm. uh, uh, super, super Upper West Side, and I'm reading the, 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 this text on the first Mughal King, and he, he's, he's having his own reflection on his life, uh, Muhammad Zahir al-Din Babur, and he speaks about how, like, you know, the, 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 the three most important figures that he knew growing up, uh, he mentions about five, but he says three of them are Burhanuddin Marghinani, Abu Mansur Maturidi, and uh, Imam Bukhari. Mm-hmm. And I remember sitting there and I'm like, Burhanuddin Marghinani, he's the author of Hidayah, by the way, of okay. this four volume Hanafi text that we studied in Madrasa. Sure. And I was so shocked because it, it's a book that we spent a lot of time with in Madrasa across two years and hundreds of hours. And it's, it's a text that you're required to know well to, to, to graduate. And I was so shocked. And he, he, is, he is from the same land as Babur. They're both from the Fargana Valley or the Basin. And um, I remember being so shocked because I was like, wait, like, I know who this figure is. Like, I've read his works. And the fact that the first, this first Mughal king is very intimately knowledgeable about this figure too, I, I mean, to, to me, it demonstrated a couple of things, right? This world is a world that was legible to me because of my mother's background. Um, it, it was also a world in which that you see uh, ulama and kings and poets all interacting and it was a world that actually we know a lot a lot about it just hasn't been translated to sort of curriculums in India Pakistan Bangladesh or even America I remember when I was in seventh grade mm. uh, in seventh grade in California which do global history or world history yeah. and I remember we had one and a half pages of the Mughals it was the first time I ever saw mm. saw their names so uh, yeah I, uh, I, uh, I I remember just reading that text and sort of just the the whole semester, we, we, we went through about six of the Mughal kings, and every single day it was like the expansion of Islamic civilization in India through the Mughals. The way that I saw it, I think, was uh, was, uh, was 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 phenomenal because I was like, I don't think that any other Muslim empire other than the Khulafa Rashidin and I guess maybe the Ottomans and slightly the Mam- the Mamluks, maybe twenty years. Yeah. Uh, but uh, of, of them and what they were able to do compares to what the Mughals were able to do for almost two two hundred fifty years. Right. You know, and and that like nobody seems to know anything about them because again, I've inherited probably the same inheritance that you have. These people were you know sort of. Uh, wayward and decadent and didn't really contribute and you know and once I was in that class I was like man there's so much to learn and so much to sort of teach about but yeah that's so growing up did, did you ever hear from like your elders and your family about like no 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 Babur the, or no no, or no the only thing we knew is just Mughal Azam was like the old this oh. old Bollywood movie okay it was very famous which okay. is a, it's, 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 it's it's a fictional it was based sure. on a fictional novel so okay yeah so and so the and that movie portrays the Mughals again as these very decadent oh okay polytheistic loving mm. people but obviously when you read the actual Persian and the Arabic it's, it's or the Turkish it's a whole different world yeah a common thread that i'm seeing in your story is that like you've had you've been for you've had the good fortune of like the people who, the subject that that like you gravitated towards were because of the certain the teachers who, who communicated the knowledge yeah 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 for sure and i mean like if columbia doesn't have a Mughal professor i you know i probably am a corporate lawyer right now or something <laughs> you know so which is which is or if azadville if Mufti Masood was not there i probably right you know, would, would we do something very different than right. what I'm doing right um, now? Can you talk a little bit about the now the reverse culture shock? Like, you're a madrasa grad, and you go, um, and it's very conservative in South Africa, to a liberal institution like Columbia. Yeah, so I think that just, just by nature of, like, my own family and, like, the the my uncles and my aunts. I mean, my uncles and my aunts don't speak Urdu, mm. so they're, they're second generation themselves. So, uh, you know, born and raised here. So uh, I had already sort of known how to interact with these people because these people were like my, pretty much my own family. Right. So it wasn't too challenging, although like there was some, uh, there were some, you know, uh, uh, mistakes that, that were needed to be made sort right. of, you know. Yeah, I got you. Well, because, you know, like you had, well, a lot of times you had this perception where people, they go, they might be even converts. They'll go overseas to study Islam for six, seven, eight years, and then they come back and it's like they they're like a fish out of water. Yeah, yeah, You know yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? No, definitely. Even no. though they come from a background, they, they, may, they may have been disbelievers before. Yeah. <laughs> they come back and they're like coming back with like as like Arabs or something. You know what I'm saying? Sure, <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, no, no. That's, that's fair. And that element was definitely present with me too. Uh-huh. But, uh, you know, after some time, it's sort of, you're, right. you're able to sort of integrate. Yeah. Right. You have spoken about, um, 
in some of your lectures about Iqbal. It's a very interesting concept because, you know, a lot of us were talking about we're, everyone's always saying, I don't have time to do this or we're struggling for time. And it's funny, the other day I was, um, I was listening to a lecture and the guy was talking about, um, like, how do we incorporate different atkar and, like, yeah. extra nawafil and stuff. And I'm like, thinking in my head, like, man, that's like two hours. I got I, I to gotta find two hours to do all this stuff, right? Um, but in, your, in one of your Iqbal talks, you talk about how Time is a creation of Allah, just like human, a human being is a creation of Allah. And that understanding that, that, that humans can manipulate that with, the, with um, a certain kind of relationship with the Prophet ﷺ, um, and you kinda like, it kind of is glossed over, right? But I feel like that's a really powerful concept that I've never heard about before. You understand what I'm saying? Like, can you elaborate a little bit about that? Like, this time as a, like, how, how do we, because you hear about things like people have barak in their time. Yeah. Right, but it's kind of glossed over. But like, how, like how would you? Um, it seems like even at age twenty nine, yourself, like if people just look at yourself. Like, what, what have you done? Mas- a, a, an island program, HIFS, bachelor's degree, master's de- master's. Right, you finish your master's in Chicago. You're like wrapping up ifta, right? By the age of twenty nine, I mean that's a testament, I think, to to you somehow implemented that yourself. I don't know if you. I don't know if that. Uh, if that talk in the, in your Iqbal lecture was like a realization of that, or like, but like, I think people are always looking for time management, but we're looking at it maybe in a very materialistic way. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, I mean, even even the phrase time time management is like a weird sort of American capitalist yeah thing because sure. you know in in the in Air, in in Persian and Urdu and Arabic that mm-hmm. we 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 wouldn't talk about time like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I think that. I don't know. I don't know if, if it's about time management for me, in as much as the that I was sort of blessed to come from a family that really, really valued mm-hmm. traditional learning and and uh, sort of advanced secular learning. So I think I would say that's that's really it for me. Was that um, by the time I was fifteen, sixteen, right? Um, they were already sort of paths for me to take. Right. And so even when I did that mother's thing, when I came back, right, because I had three siblings at Berkeley, right. I already knew what the next pack sort of the the next stage would sort of look like. But, gotcha. Yeah. Um, so, like you after Columbia, you kind of you you uh, end up at, in Chicago. Yes. Yes. Um, I want to specifically talk, look, pick your brain about Daryl Kassim because I mean I attend there at. So, as someone who's lived in Chicago fifteen years, I I had met Sheikh Amin. Uh, well, I, I I knew of Sheikh Amin pretty early on after I moved here, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Sheikh Amin Kuladia, who's the the rector of Daryl Kassim. Um, he actually um, heard me speak at a Zaytuna college event in 2008 um, at Northwestern University on the lake. Right? Oh, wow. So they had, wow. Zaytuna had a program, and that's the first time I heard of him. And he was like, okay, some another Desi Malana Saab, right? And you would hear people talk about, like, oh, that's Hafiz Amin kind of thing, right? Um, and then, like, Daryl Qasim, that was a beautiful seminar, you know. But you're, you're not from Chicago. What drew you to Daryl Qasim? And my, my take is that people in Chicago sleep on Daryl Qasim. There, I know people who live 10 minutes from Daryl Qasim. That have never been, mm, never, yeah, never yeah. entered a door. So I really want you to like talk about Daryl Qasim and why it's so critical. Yeah, and I think that you know perhaps my my background can can help me make this clear. I mean, again, when I when I had finished Madrasa, um, uh, Madrasa and abroad can be very exhausting. Yeah. Uh, so I remember feeling very exhausted. You're right. And uh, although I, I had always wanted to do ifta or, or sort of become a, you know, train to become a mufti, mm. I was like, I don't know if I have the energy and stamina to do two more years in South Africa. Right. So I ended up coming back home. And then someone had sent me a flyer for the Ar Qasim's ifta program, just mm. the flyer. Yeah. And uh, the whole curriculum was mapped out. And the curriculum was astonishing because I, being in South Africa, we have about like, we have, we have a number of ifta programs in South Africa, and I had never seen. And being someone who had been in Madrasa for so long, I had sort of seen the various ifta mm-hmm. offerings uh, of various institutions across the world. And I was like, man, I have never seen an ifta offering like this. And again, I had never heard of Sheikh Amin. I had heard of Mona Bila Ansari, but that was it. Was just really just Mona Bila Ansari. I mm-hmm. think is the person that per- perhaps people know. Yeah. And um, so I show up. So I just started my master's at U Chicago, and I was like, you know what? Let me just try this part-time ifta thing at Dar al Qasim. And we, we start off with two texts. So you came to Chicago for the University of Chicago, yeah. not Daryl Qasim? Yeah, originally, but, okay. not, but I've been here for the past two, year, past two or three years just for Daryl Qasim. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, and we do this text on, uh, on it's, it's called Shirah al Qawa'id al Fiqhiyah by, right. uh, uh, I believe, Ahmad ibn Mustafa Zarqa, mm. and also the Hujjatullah al Baligha by Shawliullah with Sheikh Amin. 
And that was my first exposure. And I remember sitting in that class at Sheikh Amin, it was me and another teacher of, uh, of Lara Qasim. And although I had spent five years, actually, you know, in, uh, or nine years, including nine to ten years, including Hibs and, 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 and Madrasa, and then, you know, three, three years at Columbia, I had never, like, the, the, the presentation of, you know, a word that Sheikh Amin uses a lot is presentation. Yeah. And the presentation and the depth of Sheikh Amin's ilm of, of sort of synthesizing so many, of, so many various spheres of, of Islam, and I would say truthfully all of them, in, one or, in, in, in every single lecture, the way that he synthesizes all those branches, I had not seen that before. Uh, because remember, in Madrasa, Mantaq and Kalam are sort of been right. erased. Yep. So I sort of got that more, a little bit more from Colombia. And I was like, man, this is something that I have not seen before. And, uh, and that approach to island to knowledge of this sort of, uh, the, the, it's, 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 it's a sort of pretentious word, but it's like u- unicity of like uniting all of these various domains as it was before modernity, right? Like okay. if you look at the curriculum of any madrasa, mm-hmm. whether in Hijaz or Istanbul or West Africa or India, I mean, they're all very, very sort of similar. I mean, obviously some, some, some texts are replaced, but uh, I mean, that, that holisticness is just no, no longer absent, mm-hmm. you know? And I think that uh, for me, Dar al-Qasim is a really singular place and a really singular institution. Uh, I would say really in the world, if only because it's, you know, you have someone like Sheikh Amin, who's an expert in so many various figures and so many various traditions. I mean, he's a mufti, he's a qadi, he's a mutakallam, uh, he's a mantiqi, he, you know, he studied hikmah and many, many other things that I probably shouldn't, uh, you know, right. disclose pub- uh, sure. publicly. Not, not, not that it's bad, but I mean, you need to come to the Al-Qasim to see it for yourself. I don't yeah, want, exactly, I don't, right. I, I, don't, yeah. I, don't, I don't want to expose everything right now. Right. Uh, but, um, and then you have someone like Marbella Ansari, who, you know, I would argue uh, is perhaps the leading muhaddith in America. Wow. I mean, his, his knowledge of Bukhari, Muslim usul al-Hadith, I mean, it's astonishing, mm-hmm. right, to just... If uh, people really don't get to see Imam Bilal and Hadith and the way they talk about Hadith, because you really only see it in class, and they see more like the, the, the sort of Khalil Center side of Imam Bilal. But like, I mean, the way Imam Bilal talks about Hadith is someone who has spent time in, in multiple Muslim countries. I mean, you don't see that in the world. I right. mean, his, his, his sort of encyclopedic knowledge of Hadith and Asanid and right. Al-Murrijal and Jarh Ta'adil and so forth. And then you have someone like Dr. Muhammad, who is a Mutakallam, who is a Turkish Mutakallam, studied in Syria and Turkey, PhD, PhD from New Chicago, you know, you know, incredible logician, incredible mutakallim, theologian, and the way that he can teach both Ashari and Maturidi theology. I mean, in Madar says, uh, they don't teach Maturidi theology anymore, even though Maturidi theology was basically, mm-hmm. you know, the, the theology of, of, of the Ottoman and, and, and Mughal empires. Right. And, uh, and then you have someone like Dr. Shukri, who is Moroccan and, you know, is his knowledge of Arabic, I mean, he's, 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 you know, one thing is to be an English dictionary and one thing is to be an Arabic dictionary. Those okay. are two very different things, you know, and he's definitely the latter and, you know, improving my own sort of modern Arabic with him and even classical Arabic poetry. And then you have Mufti Hisham who does fiqh and Islamic law. And, you know, that's been really, really phenomenal to just spend time with people like this to gather all of these sort of minds in one institute. Obviously you have Firas too, who teaches Ottoman sure. history. Right. So just to have all of these sort of various people in one institution, is, is, is breathtaking because yeah. you see this in the text when you see Imam Ghazali or other people talking about their teachers. Yeah. But to see this actually happening in, in real life is, is, is phenomenal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm, I'm a proponent of like that parents shouldn't, like sometimes, you know, parents, we have a habit of like, well, we, we'll send our kids to the madrasa or we'll send our kids. Yeah. I, like, you know, me, I'm, so I'm, I'm for, I, I, try, I try to attend what I can, right? Um, but sometimes I feel like maybe it's because in Tafsir class that, you know, that's open to everybody. You know, we get a glimpse of it. Sure, and sure, not, exactly. I don't think, and you hear about like the depth that's available, but like, and it's like, well, we have to. You just have to like cover some basics first yeah, before yeah, you yeah. can access it. And I think, I think this is where we need to sort of, and I think, thank you, thank you for this question, is that we need to sort of distinguish between lectures that make you feel good and yeah. lectures that draw upon all of Islam. Right. Right. Because there are definitely lectures that are gonna, you're gonna come out, you're gonna feel really great. Right. But it's going to be like a week-long feeling, and then you need the vibe check again. Yeah. Right? So it's like you constantly... Which is fine, and we definitely should have those spaces, not not, not criticizing them at all. But I think for me, what Sheikh Amin has, mm. that I think perhaps only a handful of scholars have in the world, is uh, with one lecture of Sheikh Amin, even if it's something as sathi, or as... I mean, also tafsir is not sathi, but something as, as public as tafsir, uh, his, 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 his weekly tafsir, is that that type of knowledge and the type of reading and the type of mutala'a that, that Mufti Amin has done... Um, and that type of synthesis, you're not going to get from anywhere else, right? Like no matter how good you feel or whatever the vibe is. Right. And 
you know, to see all of Islam presented in a lecture in the way that used to happen just 200 years ago is something, you know, um, that, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's just so rare, it's so singular. And again, the, the, the fact that it's in Chicago, right, should be, right. because, because one, one lecture of Sheikh Amin will stay with you for the rest of your life. Not just one sentence. Right. That whole lecture, because it's all, it's just, it's, it's sort of, in English we say, like, chock full of knowledge. Right. Of, of, of so many, so many various, of 1,400 years of Islam. You know, right. that's, not a, that's not a small thing. And I think to see that in America, where um, our study and our interaction and our approach to Islam has um, more often than not been sort of superficial. Mm-hmm. And I get it, people meet people at their own level. We need to have that, but we also need to make sure that we have people really engaging in Islam vertically and with depth you know because i think about it for my, my my girls my oldest is nine right yeah and she's someone who's like you could tell you know she's always reading and whatnot um what age do you think is appropriate like let's say if you, you i don't know you're not a parent but like i'm thinking about her and like eventually studying a dark classroom inshallah at some point you absolutely. know what i'm saying yeah. as, supplement, you know some way uh because she asks these questions that are like I remember she'd ask me questions about the soul when she, she was like six. Wow, <laughs> mashallah. You know what I'm saying? Or things yeah. of that sort. Because mashallah, she would read it. The thing, what, what, the thing of it is, right, I would be reading something and then she would come and at, like, be like peering over and looking over and asking me a question or um, or I'd be reading a PDF on my computer and she'd pop over and ask a question. I'm like, I don't even know how to answer that, right? Um, because that's what I'm thinking about because, like, listen, my, my kids are in Islamic schools, um, but sometimes I don't know how confident we are in that curricula right uh but if we're in chicago i mean like you have this asset like we might as well utilize it yeah absolutely absolutely because it's uh uh i think that uh we need to like really think about the vision of muslim america yeah so that's something that sh- that mufti amin and wannabe law speak about a lot yeah. and uh uh, it's exciting to see that unfold at Dara Qasim. What's the youngest student you've seen that like? Has so, so, so Dara Qasim, you have to be 18 or above to enroll. To enroll, okay. Yeah. But there's no, like, as far as, um, I mean, for the, for the Shekel Hind, it starts with Shekel Hind, right? 18. Okay, for, for you Shekel have to be 18, 18, yeah. Okay. And then, uh, but Tafsir, I think he, there's no kids. Public, in, yeah. I public. mean, like, they can still, I mean, obviously, as long as they're with the parent, there's, yeah. Of yeah, as, as long as they're, yeah. yeah. Well, it's mainly, it's mainly for. You don't you don't want a bunch of like you know baby as kids running around in the back. Yeah, yeah, you know exactly, what I'm saying. Exactly. So, but, or maybe you do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, my, my last question before we close. You had mentioned at the very beginning about like um, the different titles. Um, I, I referred to you in the beginning as Sheikh Saleh, uh, but on the Darul Qasim website you're Molana Saleh, uh, and then Sheikh Amina Sheikh. Amin. So what's the difference between like a Molana and Sheikh? Cause I've always, I thought it was just depending on what curriculum you study from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think the this is a good moment, right? So l- l- let's. Let's start from, 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 so first you have a Hafiz, right. who is someone who has memorized the Qur'an, right. uh, and then you have a Qari, who is right. technically someone who, and again, these things are not mutually exclusive, right. uh, but these are just definitions, and you have a Qari as someone who, which should be applied to someone who has sort of mastered like the Sabah Qirat or more, right. and has Tajweed and things of that nature, uh, and then you have an Imam mm. who doesn't necessarily have to be a scholar, he can, he can just be someone who, who's appointed, he doesn't even have to be a Hafiz, he can just be someone who leads the prayers at your masjid. Right. Uh, and then you have, you have uh, these, these three, I think, sort of overlap, Maulana, Mullah, and Sheikh. Okay. And these three basically should signify that someone has uh, graduated from an accredited Islamic sort of uh, institution where they've studied the major sciences of Islam, obviously, and most importantly, uh, Fusha, Ar- Quranic Arabic, Quran, Tafsir, Hadith, Fiqh, Mantiq, Kalam, and so forth. Uh, uh, and historically, uh, in, in Mughal India, Maulana was, was technically for more senior scholars, as I believe Sheikh was in sort of the Ottoman Empire. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now they're sort of all collapsed into one. Right. And uh, that's why sometimes you'll see people just call... Uh, whatever X Y Z Sheikh, even if they're if there's like an old man or something. Yeah. Although like that is also the, the linguistic meaning. Um, uh, and then you have Mufti, who is someone who is specialized in Fiqh. Uh, and then you have Muhaddith, who is someone who is specialized in Hadith. Right. Uh, and then you have Qadi, who is a judge. Right. And yeah, I would say those are those are some of the major. So it's, it's, and so, what's next for you? I understand you might be leaving Chicago. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Inshallah, will be uh, so wrapping up my Mufti program here at Darul Qasim. Inshallah. Just uh, about two two dozen fatwas left. Okay. Uh, and then we have to write a we have to write a dissertation. 
um, under Sheikh Amin's approval, and then um, and then starting a PhD in the fall, inshallah, in uh, in Islamic law. Sounds good. Well, yeah. I appreciate you coming on. I know your schedule is extremely busy. Yeah, and thank you so much and, for having um, me. You know, yeah. and, uh, I hope people benefit from it. Yeah. Um, and if people want to reach out to you or learn more about your work, so they can, can just they... email. Uh, they can just email me, okay. Salih.basir at org. Okay. Um, they can email me there. Uh, I know that we didn't, we, we didn't get to spend too much time talking about the Mughals, but a two, two great books I always tell people to start off with. Right. I had told you was that The Great Mughals by Anne Mary Schimmel. Yeah. Uh, that, just, I have that it was... in my bag right here because. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, perfect! Yeah, exactly. So, right. so, so there's one out here you can get on Amazon. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's a that's a wonderful, wonderful introduction. Right. Uh, and then another. I mean, for let's just let's let's just leave there. Once you guys finish that, email me. I'll give you because more. Because I think of it is like people ask for these book lists, and you realize I've realized that a lot. Even I ask, and people don't read them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, so it's a lot of work. We'll give one. Yeah, yeah we'll give one for now, and it, you, you, and you, you they can just email you. Yeah, they can just email me and. Uh, what's well, legal history, political history, social history, economic history. There's so much there. Yeah. Okay. Did you you mention your email address already? Yeah. Salih.basir at darulqasim.org. And that'll be active even after you leave Darulqasim? It should be. Yeah. Okay. I got and you. if it's not, I'll do email forwarding. So. Yeah, I got you. And then, uh, do you, I know people know you through your Instagram. Is that on Yeah, and off? I'm sort of on and off on that. That's why I don't sort of give it. I'm, 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 I'm trying to retire from that permanently pretty soon. Yeah. Actually, inshallah. You, should, you know what you should do is you should host some kind of like, people will see your stories about traveling the like these lands. Yeah. Um, Dr. Yakub Ahmed. He was an Ottoman historian. He was in town last week. He says the three ways that Muslims need in, the, in, the, in the West need to connect is re- we always engaging with the Quran. The other thing is, but we have American passports. We need to travel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, I was uh, I was in Uzbekistan. Yeah. Uh, to 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 go see you know the great muhaddithin fuqaha, but also to see the Mughal heartland. Right. And truly, truly, to see the birthplace of Babur and his ancestors. Mm-hmm. Uh, was something that really, really moves you uh, in ways that, uh, and also just to sort of see that, you know, um, how did Muslims live in, you know, a thousand, because those those hauntings are still present, you know? Right. So. All right, for listeners out there, if you have any questions or comments, you can email me at info at sultansandsneakers.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For my special guest, Sheikh or Mulana Salah Basir, I'm your host, Mahin the Podcaster, signing off. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. I just, I don't think any sultans wear sneakers.